and hello. Day 76 of the 100 days of narration challenge. And we're going to do it right now because that's why I'm recording. Hello, everybody. Day 76. So we are on the last day of the we are on the last day of the autobiography slash biography week. And we're going to end it the way we began it with uh, the bi autobiography of uh, that guy, Kirk. I don't know what uh, why I'm doing that voice, but it seems it seems fun. I'm probably going to do the reading in that voice for absolute for absolutely no reason. It's like a really bad mix between Sean Connery and uh, and and <laughs> an actor who does this. Wow, ah, uh, Christopher Walken. That's right. Wow. That's a neat small cowbell. Um, but yeah, Star Trek Movie Memories by William Shatner with Chris Kresge. Because he made, it wasn't enough that he made one book about his uh, adventures in the in the Star Trek. No, he made two. He made two books. One one for his, uh, his appearances as a television uh, crook. And the other for his uh, time when he was making the movies as also a as also crook. So let's read the blurb on the back here. There, the lights, the cameras, and the stars. William Shatner picks up where he left off in Star Trek Memories and advances at warp speed from 1969 to the present, uh, relating in explicit detail what went to, went into making all of the six classic Star Trek movies, plus the most recent film, Star Trek Generations. Ha! <laughs> most recent film. No. Yeah, no. Writing with the same informative and entertaining flair, Shatner discloses all the chaos, creative turmoil, backstage politics, and production mishaps that permeated every one of the movies. And with the same unflinching candor, he reveals the accumulated grudges that haven't yet mellowed with the passage of time. Brimming with anecdotes, fascinating trivia, and never-before-seen photos, Star Trek Movie Memories will provide Trekkers with enough titillating tidbits to chew on well into Star well into Star Day 2000. So this book was written before 2000. Trekkers. Are, tre are, are Trekkies known as Trekkers these days? I mean, I mean, for a while it was like, no, Trekkers is a more, uh, a more, more like a mature form of Trekkie, haha. But it's like, I don't know. It's just Trekkies seem to be more, more, um, predominant as, as a, as a, um, work, a work word for described person who is a, tre a fan of Star Trek. Unless, of course, I'm saying horrible, horrible things and, uh, uh, you Star Trek geeks would prefer to be called Trekkies or Trekkers. You, you bunch of nerds. You're all nerds, 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 nerds. Okay, that's enough of that. So let's uh, let's let's go to a random page in between, and uh, we'll just start somewhere and read from there. And uh, that sounds good to you. And me, Christopher Walken. Um, I don't know. Let's just do 210 and go from here. Yeah, starts in the middle of a sentence. Uh, okay, let's just go to the previous page and then just read from there and then we'll, then it won't start in the middle of a sentence. Still, despite the familiarity of the Enterprise and despite its position as the main setting for almost every Star Trek adventure ever written, I could never really understand Gene's objections. To me, the death of the Enterprise merely provided a great bit of cinematic drama, a wonderful, exciting, and unexpected plot twist in light of a seemingly unwinnable situation. In short, it made the film better. Gene's criticisms on the subject were for the most part dismissed without much discussion. However, when I recently spoke with Roddenberry's longtime friend and business associate Richard Arnold, I got a whole new perspective. Arnold explains, 
half fought, fought any input from Jean from the beginning, and it hurt him. It really did. But the more half fought Jean's input, the more Jean demanded attention. You know, with Khan, Harv and Nick Meyer had made some rather drastic structural and thematic changes to Jean's original vision of Star Trek. And he was now just fighting as hard as he could to preserve what was left. Nick, Harv, Leonard, the suits, everybody suddenly seemed like they wanted to improve Star Trek and to make it their own. So when the idea of blowing up the Enterprise, which lies at the very heart of the Gene Roddenberry School of Star Trek, came about, Gene had a really tough time. I think the best way to explain their difference of opinion is to mention that Harv Bennett's military experience came in helicopters over Korea, while Gene came out of World War II. When Gene was flying these great big airships, they had names. They were referred to as she. If the plane was damaged, she was wounded. He had a very similar attitude about the Enterprise. Harv's perspective was entirely different. You know, in his mind, if you crashed your helicopter and walked away from it, it was still a good landing. You just went out and got another chopper. There wasn't any real attachment to the equipment. That explains, in part, why Gene was so hurt by Harv's destruction of the Enterprise. It also explains why Harv never really understood that. Additionally, once the Enterprise was gone, Harv originally wanted to forget about building any sort of new ship and simply transplant everyone into the Excelsior, a Harv Bennett creation. That just made things worse, and Jane's take on it was a feeling that Harv was now a attempting to revise and rewrite all of Star Trek in an effort to make it his own. That feeling ultimately fueled a lot of disagreements. Still, despite the fan uproar and the poison typewriter memos that were now streaming from Gene Roddenberry's desk, Harv and Leonard continued forward. However, just when they thought the worst was behind them, the pair ran into one more script problem. This time, it came from a very unexpected source. George Decay. George explains. <clears throat> the script came, I was reading it, and I really liked it. And when I got to the scene where Kirk and Sulu break McCoy out of the hospital, I was pleased to find that my character had a really nice bit of business. Sulu enters the scene, and when he sees that a security guard on duty is half asleep with his feet up on the desk, he asks the guy, Keeping you busy? Uh, I can't do a good George George George, George to K. Oh, wait, it has to be around here. I keep forgetting. At that point, the big guy replies, Don't get smart, tidy. And later, as we're making our escape, Sulu ends up shoulder-tossing this guy to the ground and saying, Don't call me tiny. I have to admit, I just didn't get it. I mean, I had never imagined Sulu as being tiny. So I got on the phone right away with Harv and I said, Harv, it's a wonderful script. I love it. Except I think we need to rewrite this one scene where Sulu throws the big guy. I think it's a great biz I think it's a great bit of business. But this reference to I'm losing the voice again. Oh my Yes, just use Sulu's uh George Takei. Takei is a little catchphrase in order to get back, because otherwise it just starts to sound a little bit Russian. Or I don't know. Anyway, but this reference to Sulu as tidy just doesn't make sense. And now Harv says, Well, I don't know what you mean. And I said, Come on, 
Sulu is not a tiny man, and Hav says, of course not. But what you've got to understand is that this security guard is a giant. I mean, he's a Viking. And I said, well, that may be, but Harv, I know how the fans see Sulu. They don't see Sulu as tidy. He's a hero, and he mustn't be referred to as tidy. Oh, boy. My ego was now really invested in this, so I strenuously tried to talk him out of that tidy reference. On the other end of the phone, Harv is now saying, I can't believe this. I can't believe what I'm hearing. George, it's a charming, delightful scene, and you come off fantastically. You're the activator in this scene. And I said, yes, I know. I know, and I understand all that. I don't think you're quite hearing what I'm saying. This reference to Sulu as tidy. Fans will not buy it. They will not accept it. Believe me, Arv. I go to ten zillion Star Trek conventions, and I know the fans. I'm speaking for them. They will not buy that. Well, the long and short of it is, we did it. We did it. Arv says, can we make a compromise? Let's shoot it both ways and see how it plays. Will you grant me that? And I said, well, Harv, I'll tell you, all right. I will grant you that, but when the guys get... Uh, no, let's try it again. I will grant you that, but when you guys get into the editing room, I know which one you're going to use. And believe me, in a million years, you're not going to want to use the one with, that one with Tiny. It will fall flat on its face. The fans will not like that. But all right, we'll shoot it. That just goes to show how much I know. When I first found out the tiny scene was actually going to be going into the finished film, I was angry, upset, and I told Harv again, the audience won't go for this. You've made a big mistake. But then, when I first saw the film with an audience, I was amazed, because as Sulu flipped the guard and said, don't call me tiny. A raucous, a raucous? A raucous cheer went up outside, inside the theater. Until that point, I was still absolutely convinced that Harv was wrong. And when that cheer went up in that theater, I knew I was going to have to give Harv credit. So I called him once more, and I said, Hello, Harv. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm eating crow, and it tastes delicious. Well, that uh, Sulu, that George Decay went in and out there, but uh, hopefully that was still entertaining somewhat. I, uh, now we go back to uh, Christopher Walken. I should interject here to explain that even though George's tale may sound strange, it's easily explained. Decay, you see... Is nuts. It's that simple. Even as far back as the naked time when George turned a simple scene with an EP into my near disemboweling, it's been obvious that he can get away. He can get a bit, shall we say, carried away. Quite simply, he is far and away the most enthusiastic, enthusiastic trekker among us Star Trekkers. For example, limiting myself to just Star Trek Three, George accompanied his battle to erase Sulu's diminutive nickname by personally leading groups of tourists through our Star Trek Three sets, bugging almost every crew camp. <laughs> wow. I'm not doing too good here. Bugging almost every cast and crew member at least once a day throughout our production and ultimately demanding work as an extra during the film's climactic Vulcan ritual scene. Uh, uh, can't go without the burping. The reason for this wasn't money or screen time. George merely couldn't pass up the chance to wear a genuine Vulcan ceremonial robe at least once. Still, despite the occasional manic behavior, 
George's goodwill and unshakable onset ebullience, 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 e-b-u-l-l-i-e-n, sorry, e-b-u-l-l-i-e-n-c-e, ebullience, 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 onset ebullience. Onset ebullience make him a joy to work with and just plain fun to be around. By week's end, back in Harv Bennett's office, the script for Star Trek III had officially been beaten into submission, achieving final draft status. Now it was time for Harv and Leonard to begin casting. As with any working relationship, they'd suffer a few growing pains. Leonard remembers. Uh, that's no. Yes? No. Uh, I'm tired. <laughs> Let's just stop there for today. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed enjoyed my strange Christopher Walken type thing. Not really Christopher Walken at all. I, I don't know. I'm just making weird vowel sounds. Um... Yeah, and that was day 76 of the 100 Days of Narration Challenge. Tomorrow will be day 77. And since it's the start slash beginning of a new week, it will be a mystery book challenge. And since nobody got the last week's mystery book challenge uh, for day 70, it will be two prizes going this week. Two, two, two. And I'm going to choose, hmm, it's another theme week, and I think I'll go for something a bit e easier. A bit easier, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm going to do, a bit easier, so yeah. So, today was day 76, that was Star Trek Movie Memories by William Shatner with Chris Kreskin. I hope you enjoyed that. Come back tomorrow for the Mystery Book Challenge, and be amazed by the book that I will choose, because it's, uh going to be amazing or something i don't know okay see you guys then hey you seem like a cool wonderful and or awesome individual with impeccable taste in voice actors so why not follow me on facebook or twitter you can keep up with the latest projects i'm in or that my friends are in or that you could be in because i occasionally post links to open editions to various projects that require voice acting out there or that nobody's in but they're interesting projects nonetheless that you may also find interesting also lots of random thoughts about whatever's on my mind at that particular moment usually it's about food or video games or foodie video games mm. anyway you can follow me on facebook at omadon va or twitter at omadon hope to see you there